Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, everybody. Once again, Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, and you are on the air with IHWE Radio. I am your host, Michael McCurdy, the creator and author of Encyclopedia WCCW. And joining me tonight, I have a special guest co-host. He is the research assistant for Encyclopedia WCCW and one all-around Encyclopedia of Wrestling Knowledge, Brian Westcott. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Great to be on the show. All right, man. Thank you. I appreciate you calling in to help me co-host on this one tonight. Unfortunately, my regular co-host for the evening, the man I like to refer to as the king of all media, sorry, Howard Stern, but Dave's got a better title, He's un- unable to be with us tonight. He had a family emergency come up. We hope his son's doing well. They're at the ER right now checking out the little boy. So hopefully he'll be calling in later tonight and give us a little update on what's going on. But tonight we've got two special guests on air with us. Our first hour we're going to be joined by Bruce Hart of the Hart Wrestling Family. He operates Hart Brothers Wrestling, or excuse me, Hart Brothers University. He will be joining us tonight to talk about that training program, and also in our second hour, we will be joined by Bill Anderson. He will be coming on to talk to us about uh, his career, the books he's written so far. There's two out, I believe, and I think he has a third one on the way. And also, we're just going to be talking about a little bit of general wrestling today, kind of get some opinions, see what's going on. Hopefully, we'll have some callers in. So, Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you for co-hosting once again. And, well... Is there anything out there tonight, wrestling-wise, you see anything Monday night, you want to just get off your chest, you got something you want to say, here's your open forum. Wow. Well, well, like I say, I know most of us were kind of shocked by what we uh, saw at the Royal Rumble, not to mention, of course, CM Punk leaving. So that's going to be real interesting to see uh, what's going to happen. And, of course, just uh, read an interesting interview on a uh, slam uh, wrestling uh, Canadian website with about jo- uh, AJ Styles. AJ Styles is now one of the hottest free agents, and he's taking some matches in ROH, and uh, who knows where we'll see him next. But I don't think he'll be going back to TNA anytime soon. As far as CM Punk, who knows? Part of me thinks this could be a well-established work, but at the same time, like I say, CM Punk is 35. He's not getting any younger. If he wants to try MMA, he's going to do it while he's going to strike while the iron's hot, to use the old catchphrase. So we'll see how things go. We were talking about CM Punk last week. While I haven't thought of a MMA style, my personal opinion on it is I think we're kind of setting this up maybe, for a Triple H versus CM Punk at WrestleMania. That's my opinion. Now, if you read online, they're talking about now, they might be penciling Daniel Bryan in, to where he'll face Triple H at WrestleMania. Another great match. As far as AJ Styles goes, well, Ring of Honor, great fit for him. I've heard he might be going to Mexico, do some matches in Japan, possibly. Maybe we might see him in WWE. I don't know. He could fit. He could also be one of those that they bring him in and Vince just chooses not to push him as much because he was a TNA guy. We've seen it before. We're seeing it now. He's brought over Consequences Creed, who was in TNA. Now he's Xavier Woods. I don't think they're pushing him that much, partially because he was a TNA wrestler. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I could certainly see the logic in that for sure. Be interesting um, to see how things go between now and WrestleMania. Definitely. We are on the road to WrestleMania, obviously. Um, they do have the Elimination Chamber match set up. We've got Randy Orton. He's going to be defending that title. Daniel Bryan, John Cena, Sheamus, Antonio Cesaro, and Christian are his opponents. I think there's going to be a little change in that lineup before the pay-per-view, though. I don't see Christian or Antonio Cesaro really being in that match. Somehow, I think you might see Roman Reigns get in there. 
we maybe might see all three members of the Shield in this. I don't know. I don't see Antonio Cesaro or Christian staying in this, though. One or the other, maybe both are going to have to go. That's my personal opinion. Some people may not agree with me on that. We'll see what happens. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, unfortunately, we've seen uh, both Antonio Cesaro and Christian really get into the middle of the card, but uh, yeah, who knows what they've got up their sleeve. We still don't even know who The Undertaker is going to take on, and I know they're still working on it, knock on wood. Hopefully, we'll actually finally get to see Sting take on The Undertaker. I don't see Sting taking on The Undertaker this year. It's too soon. Next year, definitely. If they sign him, they get him on board. I see him working out for, you know, maybe bring him in for a couple other matches, you know, set it up. Save him for the big shows, though. We don't need to see Sting on Monday Night Raw every week. We don't need to see him on SmackDown every week. You need to save him. He's in his 50s. Still knows how to work. Definitely not in his prime. Got to wait. Save him. Save him for the big events. Save him for SummerSlam. Save him for Survivor Series. Do the occasional spot on Raw, mostly behind the mic. Save him next year's WrestleMania. This year's WrestleMania, we may see Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker. Personally, I think this would be a great opportunity to see possibly Roman Reigns break away from the Shield and want to end that streak. All he has to do is say, I want to end the streak. Undertaker comes out, answers the challenge, there's your match. I personally think Roman Reigns can hold his own. I think he could do it. I think it would be a great match. That's kind of what I want to see. Not interested in seeing Brock Lesnar. The man is a beast. But to see Undertaker take him on, I don't see Undertaker losing at WrestleMania. He's going to retire undefeated at WrestleMania. But it will be awfully hard to be able to put Undertaker over Brock Lesnar, in my opinion. So Roman Reigns, definite potential for a match with The Undertaker. I know everybody's leaning for Brock Lesnar. There's been talk about Daniel Bryan. Undertaker is always a tough choice. You never know what he's going to do until about a month before, as I said last week. All he does, he comes out, you hear the bell, he'll come out, the slash across the throat. There's your match. We're done. All he's got to do. Then you'll have your two or three weeks of promos, and you go to WrestleMania. Being in a match at WrestleMania with The Undertaker guarantees you one of the top three matches. Doesn't matter who the opponent is, he's facing The Undertaker, puts him at the top level for WrestleMania. Yeah, definitely. Definitely could see that happen. Be interesting to see how things go. Also, uh, today we've got two big anniversaries. It was 30 years ago today that we, uh, the, the probably the biggest superstar in the history of Lucha Libre in Mexico, El Santo, died. He was in his 60s, buried with his mask on. Think of the biggest icons in the United States. Put them all together, and that's El Santo. He was big superstar in the ring as well as in movies. I mean, it's quite the phenomenon. And then, of course, 26 years ago today, the infamous match where Andre the Giant pinned Hulk Hogan wins the World Wrestling Federation World Heavyweight Championship on the main event, Indianapolis, Indiana. And, of course, we see the debuts of Dave and Earl Hebner, the evil twins, and that whole storyline, which, of course, set up uh, WrestleMania Four. And how many years ago was that? Like I said, the the, the main event that, that was like it was twenty six years ago today. Wow, I remember watching that. That was one of the special Friday nights main events, I believe. That was one of their prime time yep. specials, I believe. Correct. Yeah, I remember watching that when it happened. He got titled, and then, yeah, the two referees twenty six years ago. Good God, do I feel old? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. 
WrestleMania 4, and now we're going on to WrestleMania 30. Yeah. Also, another thing, you know, I almost forgot about this, and I would feel horrible if I did. Today, February 5th, I would like to wish a happy birthday to Barbara Goodish, the widow of the great Bruiser Brody. Today's her birthday. Happy birthday, yes. Barbara. I hope you're enjoying it. Thank you for all the years your husband gave us in that ring. Thank you for, honestly, thank you for sharing him with us. I know that was a tough thing. He was a traveling man. He went all over the world. But he created such a legend for himself and it cuts a spot in the history of this sport. So, Barbara, thank you for that. Happy birthday. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Definitely. I echo uh, Michael sentiments and... uh... Brody was a great anti-hero and just a, a big legend, an icon, and someone people looked up to, the greatest brawler in the history of this business, bar none. Uh, Wrestling Observer Newsletter, they named their brawler award after him as a result. That's how uh, famous he got. So, so yes, uh, thank you, Barbara. hope your son Jeffrey's doing well. Thank you for all you done, and thank you for letting him uh, be part of our lives. All right, we've got just a few more minutes before Bruce Hart will be joining us, and I'm going to take this opportunity. Normally, with this show, we're here to talk about wrestling. That's the thing. IWE Radio, the Legends of Texas Wrestling, Legends of Wrestling Around the World, that's what we're here to talk about, but I'm going to jump on my soapbox for just a second. We're going to break away from wrestling for just a minute. I think I can segue back in. Brian, I don't know if you're a football fan, but you had to at least seen a little bit of the Super Bowl. Did you see the Coca-Cola ad? Oh, yeah, I did get to see some of that. Exactly. I'm going to take a second here. I told David, I asked, I said, can I reference it? He said, sure, go ahead. People, it's a commercial. It was a one-minute ad. In my opinion, it was well done. Yes, it's America the Beautiful, and it is sung in multiple different languages, but they're singing our song. They're singing America the Beautiful. It's not a collage of the Israeli National Anthem and the Canadian National Anthem and all that. It's America the Beautiful sung in different languages. It's supposed to be showing the cultural diversity of America. You got people on the Internet now on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else. I'm not drinking Coca-Cola anymore. They're anti-American. Blah, blah, blah. Coke is bad. Don't drink Coke. Boycott Coke. It's an American song. Now, I can segue this to wrestling real fast. Years ago, Sergeant Slaughter, Iraqi Sympathizer, we hated Sergeant Slaughter. WrestleMania 7. They had to move to a small arena security wise because of terror, because of death threats. People hated Sergeant Slaughter. Sergeant Slaughter was the enemy. But as soon as he waved the American flag and said, I apologize for everything I did, saluted the flag, we loved him once again. So, like wrestling. You see that commercial right now? Boo, Coke. We hate them. Give it two or three months, people. Maybe not even two or three months. Two or three weeks. A couple days. And all of a sudden, you're going to reach into that refrigerator. You're going to be like, oh, it's so hot. I'm thirsty. You're going to crack open that cold Coca-Cola. You're going to drink that thing. You're going to forget about the commercial. So right now, if you're a wrestling fan, pretend that right now, Coca-Cola is Sergeant Slaughter. Bad guy now. Later on, you'll forget about it. He's a good guy. But whatever. Segway into wrestling. Segway into a commercial. It's bottom line. It's a commercial. Just, all right, I'm going to get off my soapbox on that one. I just had to say it. I've been listening to it for days. My opinion, I have open air. Hopefully, people aren't going to stop listening now. I hope I don't drop any callers, but I had to say something. Yeah, I saw the commercial. I did not see any problem with it. And it, I thought it made a nice gesture to the melting pot that America is. I mean, we're all products of immigration for the most part. 
wasn't for that, none of us would be here. Yeah, besides, yeah, give it a few weeks. Besides, we've got the Olympics coming up. So we'll have already forgotten about the Super Bowl, and we've already will be moving on to other things. My point exactly. Thank you for agreeing with seeing my side of this. I've had this argument a couple times with some people. It's just, I don't know. I wanted to come on. I wanted to make a couple jokes, you know, but I decided, no, I was going to go classy. I'm just going to come out and state my opinion. Like I said, I'm the host. we got live radio, golden opportunity, and we're on the, it's about the 8.15 Central Standard Time. We should be hearing from our guest. Once again, we're being joined in this first hour by Bruce Hart from the Hart Brothers University. He'll be joining us tonight to talk about training with Hart Brothers University. He's going to tell us some stories about training in the dungeon with his father, the late Stu Hart. He's, I had a chance to talk to him a few minutes ago, do a little pre-interview. We're going to get his opinions on Owen sometime going into the Hall of Fame. He's got a couple, He's got his opinion on that. We talked about that for a little bit. I think people are going to be, you know, I think they're going to like to hear what he's got to say. Yeah, looking forward to it. And then also in our second hour, as I said earlier, we will be joined by Bill Anderson. He's the author of two books, Big Bill Anderson Remembers the School of Wrestling and Big Bill Anderson Remembers His Fallen Friends of Wrestling. I believe the third book he's working on is not wrestling related. I believe that one is a the so-called death tour of California, I think is what it is, all the famous celebrity sites where all the all the celebrity deaths and, you know, like the Manson and all those other things. But he'll be on to talk about that. What one thing is people may not realize is Bill Anderson, along with Red Bastine, they trained a lot of the guys you see in the ring now, including the man we were just talking about a few minutes ago, Sting. He also had a hand in training the Ultimate Warrior, who's going into the Hall of Fame this year. So maybe we'll get Bill's opinions on that and tell us a couple stories of – Yeah, that should be a good one, too. Okay. All right, folks. Um, As always, the wonders of live radio. We seem to be having a little bit of a communication error. Brian, I hate to do this to you. If you can kind of take over the reins for a minute, Maybe give us a little more historical facts. I'm going to take care of something. I will be right back. All right. Well, folks, as we mentioned, uh, February 5th, big day today. El Santo passing away. We had Andre the Giant taking on Hulk Hogan, winning the title. And we've also got another anniversary coming up. Uh, one of, And I'll ask Bill Anderson about this in the second hour. I want to ask of his thoughts on uh, a man that he was involved in training, and we got to see this man develop until we tragically lost him in February of 1998, the one, the only, Louis Spicoli. And Louis Spicoli, I thought, had tremendous amounts of talent and potential. And, yes, he even got to hold a few championships, he uh, did get to WCW, and just right about then, you know, tragedy struck. And we lost him at a very young age. And just all these things we see in the news, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, his recent death, and just, like we say, yes, a lot of negativity. But we also, at least with Encyclopedia WCCW, we want to focus on the positive. We want to focus on all the wonderful things that pro wrestling has brought to us. And yes, despite some of the heartaches and tragedies we all go through in life, uh, yes, we have a chance to move on and be better. And yes, it is a great to be a part of this with IHWE Radio. To and yes, of course, the IHWE Texas Wrestling Hall of Fame. That will be uh, that ceremony will be coming up here shortly. Also, uh, this weekend. For the wrestlers out there, if you can get in touch with Johnny Mantell, he'll give you the details 
on the Texas shootout in uh, something Red Bastide set up. And uh, it's a boys-only reunion. Location is top secret. But basically it would be a nice, uh, go to a nice place for lunch and uh, just a great reunion for everybody, which, of course, will lead right into uh, the big shindig in June, June the 2nd through the 4th. Cauliflower Alley Club, 49th Reunion, Gold Coast, Hotel and Casino. Make sure you get your banquet tickets, get your hotel reservations. You will not want to miss it. Terry Taylor is being honored. Go Hayes of the Fabulous Freebirds will be honored. Adam Pierce, former NWA World Heavyweight Champion, cheerleader Melissa Anderson. And y'all have to ask Bill Anderson about her as well. So, uh, yeah, he kind of uh, had some uh, ties in, in, to her training. Got to know uh, her father real well. So, like I say, folks, uh, we I'm, are looking for some great stuff. Yes, Michael? Sorry to, uh, sorry to break in there. Did have a little bit of technical difficulty. Like I said, the wonders of live radio. We do have the situation under control. And joining us now is Bruce Hart from Hart Brothers University. How are you, Mike? How you doing tonight, Bruce? I'm doing all right. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Oh, cool. Yeah, I didn't know that I got through or not. That's cool. So, yeah, doing well. Uh, thanks for the vine, as they say. Uh, what's shaking? No problem. Thank you for joining us tonight. Sorry about some of the little technical difficulties there. I understand you had a problem calling in for a second. But we did get the situation yeah, under control. no con- problem. Uh, well, it's, uh, Hello, nice Brian. To, uh, meet- Hi, Bruce. Yes, uh, nice to finally get to talk to you, Bruce. I got to meet uh, Smith as well as Ross as well as Bob Johnson with the Cauliflower Alley Club. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad he got a chance to meet them all uh all stand up uh people and good friends of mine, so Yeah, definitely. Hi Bruce. Hi Bruce, let's have let's start this interview here. Um Okay. As I was telling earlier, you are now associated you started Hart Brothers University. Um if you don't mind, maybe you can give us a little bit of the history behind Hart Brothers University, how it started and it's what the goal it's is. It's basically for, uh, just an extension or an evolution of, uh, you know, I've been in the business for uh, a long time. I was sort of wrestling and uh, booking and training those guys for my dad back in the 80s. So uh, at that time, I was turning out guys like uh, the Bulldogs and uh, Brett and... Owen and Pillman and Benoit and Liger and Hasse and uh, Hashimoto, guys like that. So, um, yeah, we kind of restarted it a, a few years back uh, for a number of reasons. You know, we sort of had, uh, as you were probably aware, we had had some heat or a bit of a falling out with. WWE after Owen's death and a lot of the uh, acrimony uh, that was, you know, kind of going down after Brett and the Montreal and all that stuff. But uh, we sort of uh, had uh, mended the fences. And, um, but, yeah, I had a lot of people uh, approaching us and my own kids who they were kind of just getting of that age, you know, in their late teens, and they were, you know, uh, intrigued with the wrestling. So we kind of uh, had started people, some of whom you're probably familiar with, people like Harry, who later became David Hart Smith in WWE, and mm-hmm. Natalia and TJ uh, Aka, Tyson Kidd, and some of those guys. So uh, it was just sort of... Uh, an extension of that, you know. Uh, but, yeah, as I said before, you know, we've had a, you know, long before I was training guys, my dad was uh, 
you know, doing his thing in the dungeon, which was uh, where we were training guys as well, you know, and uh, it was sort of almost legendary, you know, all the guys who came through there and, uh, you know, cut their teeth down in that dungeon, you know, uh, from as far back as the uh, guys like Mad Dog Vashon and the Johnny Valentines and the uh, Stompers and, uh, you know, uh, Tolis Brothers and the, you know, uh, uh, Ilio DiPaolo and all those types. Even Gorilla Monsoon was down there back in his early days, uh, long before he became Gorilla Monsoon, you know. And uh, So, you know, we had a pretty uh, extensive uh, history, and uh, that, that's long been one of my... Uh, Opinions is uh, it's one of the things the wrestling business has uh, really lost in the last twenty thirty years is uh, the grassroots that it, it once had. You know, there back in the day when I was starting in wrestling, there was uh, you know thirty territories, and uh, you'd uh, be able to go from one place to another, and uh, you know it was some awesome learning territories like Minneapolis and Amarillo and, uh, you know, uh, Portland and even uh, down in Ontario, there was a whole bunch of guys coming out of there that were phenomenal. And some of the guys that uh, were in California down in the old Joe Malkowicz and uh, Eileen Eaton era, you know, that kind of thing. So that's sort of all uh, been lost in the last... 20, 30 years, so, you know, so that, that's sort of, in a nutshell, what uh, one of our primary in, initiatives or objectives is to kind of restore some old school and uh, re-sow the seeds at the grassroots, you know, there's no, uh, I can't even fathom uh, any other major sports such as, say, hockey or baseball or basketball or football if, if they did away with, like, the... Uh, college football or they did away with little league and uh you know baseball leading up to major leagues or you know hockey up here you know if you did away with junior and all like that you know the whole thing would kind of die on the vine you know and uh wrestling's kind of in my estimation gone that way you know it it's kind of a reflection of the uh shortage of talent right now that they have to keep uh, invariably going back like the last half dozen WrestleManias. Uh, the main event almost every year is bringing Brett back or bringing The Rock back or this year bringing Batista or Brock Lesnar or uh, you know that Shawn Michaels or The Undertaker for the 400th time or something like that you know uh, but doesn't say much about uh, for the uh, the new Breed, you know the up and coming guys when uh, they seem to always have to go back to the uh, the blasts from the past. So I think uh, it, it says a lot about the need for uh, you know uh, developing new talent and and you can't just develop new talent uh, in these sterile env- environments like uh, like NXT or FCW and all like that. The other side of the coin is you actually have to, you know, uh, give these guys an opportunity to uh, apply what they've learned and um, and qualify anything and everything you're teaching them with some rationale or explanation. You know, all too often I see guys doing stuff in the ring for no perceptible reason. You know, dyeing their hair, or wearing, you know, adopting goofy gimmicks and doing high spots and crap and uh, you ask him after uh, why did you do this or how come you're uh, adopting this role or that and they don't even have any idea you know they just sort of uh, it's all kind of uh, hit and miss and uh, like a glorified version of flinging shit against the wall and hoping something will stick type thing so I think they need to you know go back to uh, square one and uh, learn the basics and uh have some perceptible idea of why they're doing what they're doing and apply it, then there should be some, uh, you know, uh, purpose in uh, 
whatever to whatever they're doing, you know. So that's all part of the whole uh, learning process. It, it, you know, it's kind of the way it used to be back in the day. You know, it's it's kind of unfortunate that there's like when I when I was breaking into the business, uh, there were so many of these really you know ring wise savvy uh, older guys that you know would give you advice and uh, guys like Dory Funk Sr. and Vern Gagne and uh, Don Owens and uh, you know Gene LaBelle and all these guys all over the place you know he'd uh, get schooled and all the uh, little subtleties and that kind of thing and nowadays there's virtually none of that you know it's uh, way harder and uh, so I'm hopeful that uh you know, some of those things kind of uh, come back. You know, that's something the business sorely needs. All right. Well, I have just been informed that we are being joined now by my regular co-host. David Fuller is now on in the studio with us. David, how are you doing tonight? Oh. I'm doing all right. I had a little. Uh, my son had a little cough. We wanted to go get him checked out since he's only about six weeks old, and the weather is uh, a little colder down here than normal. But I'm on. I'm, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I'm so happy Bruce Hart is on. Uh, Bruce, I got a, one real quick question. Uh, yeah, I hope, heard... hope your son's doing well, Dave. I, uh, I got five kids myself, so I can thank you very empathize. much. I hope it's, everything went well. Oh yeah, he's he's doing he's doing great. He's a real trooper. Uh, my question for you is, and it's an honor to be speaking with you. Anybody who's a real student of the game knows that the Hart family. I grew up in the Dallas Fort Worth area, so we had the Von Air family, but the, the Hart family is the family in wrestling, along with the Von Actually, Eric, the Von I, when I was Ritter. a little kid, uh, Fritz <laughs> Fritz Von Eric was staying in my dad's backyard in a trailer, and he was breaking in up here himself, old Fritz. So, and I remember the uh, the kids were. The older ones were, you know, staying in the trailer. I sort of knew them all, the David and uh, Kevin, and uh, there was Jackie, the oldest one, who unfortunately uh, got killed yeah. when he was. But, uh, yeah, we, I, I knew them all quite well. You know, Fritz cut his teeth up here. I, mean, I remember a lot of those old Texas guys, Luis Hernandez and Bronco Lubitsch and uh some of those guys were all uh, up here, so it, it was kind of cool. I had a bit of uh, opportunity to hang with the Texas guys, and of course later on, Dory and Terry and uh, all those guys from Amarillo. So. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of good people who've come from here. My question is: is a lot of people we we've heard about this on on various DVDs and whatnot. Uh, in Canada during the Stampede days, I've heard uh, story after story after story about the treacherous weather and the the, the roads. And I mean, back then, I mean, nowadays we got cell phones, we got GPSs, but back when you guys were doing it, your family, your brothers, the conditions you had to travel in. Give our listeners, and maybe some of the people that broke into the business a few years ago, an idea of what it was like going from town to town in Canada during the worst time of the year. <laughs> It was sort of an ongoing, uh, and it, it was uh, it wasn't that good even in the summer, but the winter was. Uh, we were averaging about two thousand miles a week every week driving through. Uh, we were sort of like the uh, U.S. Postal Service, you know, through sleet and rain and hail and all. You know, we so yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> It was kind of uh, strange. Uh, very rarely do we ever miss a shot, but I remember having to drive through blizzards and mountain, uh, you know, through the mountains, and uh, they would have the highway closed and uh, tell us if we broke down, we were on our own, and all this other. And, uh, but yeah, I remember a few of the. Uh, <laughs> I remember some of the guys that uh, had come up here from the states, like Junkyard Dog, when he first came up here, and. None of those guys ever dressed for the weather, you know. They're always like dressed up in their, uh, you know, cording clothes, and they'd be wearing uh, loafers and a silk suit and whatever. And all the uh, normal guys up here wearing down parkas and 
And, you know, and I can't KYD name how many times. KYD was using yeah. this Mid-South weather. <laughs> yeah, and, and I remember some of those guys in tears, <laughs> the guys from, uh, like, Puerto Rico and Hawaii and uh, Australia and some of those warm weather places, and they, they uh <laughs> You know, I, I remember we had this big Hawaiian up here named King Curtis, who was from Hawaii, and uh, he used to refer to it as the bitter end up here. <laughs> but yeah, it was. Uh, you know, almost every week there was some something going on. You know, if the, if we weren't breaking down, there was invariably all kinds of ribs and practical jokes being perpetrated and. Uh, all that type of stuff. I think Calgary was sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, almost notorious for the uh, the practical jokes and the uh, ribbing and all that crap. You know, <laughs> there were some pretty diabolical rivers up here, the Dynamite Kids, and the uh, I think even old Johnny Valentine was kind of uh, got his. Start doing that up here. And, uh, he trained me. He trained me. I met Johnny in '98, and he broke me into the business. He trained me, and he told me about some of the ribs he he did. And, and you just, I mean, Johnny, Johnny, he didn't open up to me, you know, right at first. But I remember one day we were talking, and he started telling me about the ribs, and he was just live and his big deep voice. And so I could not believe some of the stuff. And then I talked to other people in the business years later, and they confirmed it. Like, yeah, he he's not lying. He he did that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know he sent his son up here, Greg, who uh, at that time was, we had him teamed up with this notorious, who's almost legendary, river and degenerate named Don Fargo, or Don Colts, you know, and uh, <laughs> there was, I think Buddy Roberts was just getting his feet wet up here too, and he was kind of in on some of that, but there was uh, <laughs> just one one episode after another, you know, and my dad always seemed to have a propensity for some of those other old uh, kind of degenerate rivers like uh, Ted Christie and some of those guys, you know, and uh, Tommy O'Toole and uh, Frankie Murdoch and some of those old uh, (laughs) borderline degenerate rivers, you know. They added a lot of flavor to the business, so there was... uh, it always something happening, you know. The, it doesn't seem to be that many uh, guys of that uh, ilk <laughs> these days, you know. But uh, but those, those are all some of the guys that you know, kind of made the business what it was, you know. I think old Harley got he was in on, you know, pretty good old river as well. And Terry Funk when they were up here, they're always up to some little uh, <laughs> bit of uh, mischief or whatever the hell, you know. The, whether the Babel parties or the, uh, you know, the <laughs> some of the other stuff, I probably can't uh, discourse on on uh, in public about it. Quite often, <laughs> you don't like to discourse on it because uh, some of the victims are still alive. You know, they might, <laughs> and they probably don't know that uh, some of that stuff was perpetrated on them or some of that. You know, so. Those are like urban, you know, they're, they're sure. urban I legends just, up there that'll be talked about for years and years, but they're actually not urban legends. They're true. It's just they'll be talked about for years and years, and, and people won't know who did it or perpetrated it. So there you go. It's a big mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bruce, if I can jump in here real quick. You're talking about some of the the, the ribs and some of the big rivers that were going through the Canada area. Um, I've had a chance to talk with Ross, um, at the Cauliflower Reunion and Brett as well. And from what I understand, that Owen was quite a, uh, was one of the big rivers. He had uh, quite the passion for the practical jokes. I was wondering, is there any, yeah. like, one person you, that really stands out to you that maybe you could share with uh, our listeners? Because I know for myself, I'm a big fan, you know, of Owen. I still watch some of his stuff. My son is actually named after him. So I'm sure our listeners would love to hear if there's a, a classic uh, rib that you might be able to share with us. Uh, there was a few on. Was always up to up to uh, <laughs> something. Um, good thing about Owen, he always did it so subtly that uh, <laughs> it never seemed like it was a rib, you know. But I remember uh, 
back in the 90s, there was some one of those WrestleManias. I think it was down in L.A. or something like that. And uh, I remember way back when my dad had this guy back in the 50s broke in up here, sort of a mid-card guy named Reggie Parks. And uh, he had later on kind of done the circuits and been around, you know, and pretty mild-mannered guy. <laughs> but I remember when, apparently when he started up here in the 50s, uh, I think my dad and uh, my dad used to have a few of those other old shooters, uh, like George Gordianko and Luther Lindsay and Gordon Nelson. Those guys used to kind of uh, put the new guys through their paces when they were getting uh, into the business. And I think back in the day, my dad, I think, stretched Reggie Parks uh, several times down there and kind of... Uh, you know, kind of chewed him up and spit him out or whatever. But anyway, uh, <laughs> my dad, uh, I guess, uh, was down at uh, one of those WrestleManias or whatever in L.A. And uh, and I guess Owen called up uh, my dad's hotel room. Owen was really awesome at impersonating voices to a T, you know. And so I guess Owen called up my dad's room as Reggie Parks and... Uh, <laughs> Started, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> stew. It's, it's and he was stammering and all like this. It's 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 Reggie Parks and uh, I, I just like to say that uh, you know uh, you can not beat me in your best day and all this other and that you uh, you know uh, you know took advantage of me when I was breaking in and all this other and he kind of went on this long diatribe about uh you know uh, if I see you in the lobby still you know I want you to go for your best hold or something like that okay. and uh so anyway uh a while later at the function or whatever Reggie Parks came up <laughs> to Stu just to say hi. <laughs> My dad had been so worked up by on that he exploded <laughs> on Reggie Parks. I think my dad was in his seventies or or whatever at this time and said if you wanna go right now, Reggie go for it or something like that. Uh, Reggie Parks had no idea what my dad was talking about, why my dad is uh firing up and uh, you know, basically uh asking if he wants to shoot right in the middle of the the lobby or whatever the hell, you know. So that was sort of like one of the on stories, but um he, he used to do that stuff pretty regularly, you know. He had a pretty, uh, a pretty good sense of humor. And the good thing about Owen is, uh, even after he had pulled these ribs, you're never quite sure if, uh, you know, if you had been ribbed or whether it was, uh, you know, uh, for real or whatever, you know. So, but, but yeah, he was he was a great guy to have in the in the territory always kind of that a bit of that kind of humor kept everybody kind of uh you know kind of uh, loosened everyone up and made it a lot more fun now you know since we're on the subject of Owen here for just a moment we were talking about the Hall of Fame uh just a few minutes earlier before you came on and Obviously, so far they've announced Jake Roberts and Ultimate Warrior for this year's class. What is your opinion on them one day inducting Owen into the Hall of Fame? Do you I've been think advocating it. He's done. Yeah, or? I think it should have been. I think he should have been inducted already. He should have been inducted a long time ago. You know, obviously there's, uh, I think, some sensitivity there with his widow Martha, who's. I don't think she has any uh, regard for WWE or anything, but uh, just from a, a wrestling and a fan perspective, I think that he's, uh, you know, it's long overdue. And, you know, he uh, obviously paid the ultimate price for the wrestling business, but beyond that, you know, he was uh, he was a phenomenal worker, you know. Quite honestly, I don't think he... Uh, and it's kind of sad. He was just, I think, on the verge of really uh, coming into his own. 
you know, for a long time when WWE brought him in there, they didn't, uh, I thought they misused him, you know, I never thought he was uh, well used as a heel, and uh, some of the other incarnations they had at high energy with Coco and the Blue Blazer and the American Eagle and the Blue Demon and all that crap, you know, was uh, almost like a rib, but uh, when he finally started to uh, just when they finally just uh, let him do his thing, you know, I think he would have really uh, ascended to uh, every bit as high a level, if not higher than Brett. I always thought Owen was a better athlete than Brett and a little more dynamic. And uh, so I think he uh, definitely uh, should be in the Hall of Fame, and I'm hoping... Uh, that happens, and while I'm on that topic, I, I've i long advocated that two other Stampede alumni, uh, Dynamite Kid and Davey Boy, should be in there, too. You know, I can't fathom why they're not in there. You know, they were uh, cutting edge and uh, dynamic, and they were one of the best tag teams in WWE history, and... Uh, as single performers, you know, it's it's almost a shame that when Dynamite Kid finally got to the WWE, even though he's probably only in his 20s, even then he was already kind of, uh, you know, damaged goods. But uh, if you think back on uh, their singles capability, you know, and, uh, you know, all, all over the world, you know, in England and Japan and the States and up here, you know, uh, very few guys that were even uh, in their league. You know, Dynamite might be one of the most copied guys I've ever seen in the business. You know, I've seen all those, uh, you know, flyers from the 80s that emulated him, and none of them duplicated him either, like even Shawn Michaels and, uh, you know, Chris Benoit and Pillman and Liger and uh, guys like that. You know, they idolized him, you know, and he, he was kind of the cutting edge of all that, you know, and, and Davey Boy was uh, right up there, you know, as you guys know, when he did the Wembley thing with Brett, you know, it's still considered one of the great matches in WWE history. And uh, it's, it's beyond me why those two guys aren't in the Hall of Fame either. You know, they certainly, uh, you know, warrant uh, inclusion, you know, far more than a lot of the people that have already been inducted. You know, I'm not sure if they're... I have no I idea agree. why they haven't been inducted at this time. You know, yeah. I'd throw a vote in for my old buddy Pillman too. You know, he was pretty uh, kind of a radical, cutting edge type. You know, when he was doing that Booker Man stuff with Kevin Sullivan and all like that, he he was kind of. It's, I'd say about all those guys that I've been talking about, every one of them was uh, a cutting edge original. They weren't copies or clones or cheap ripoffs of some other horseshit gimmick or other guy, you know, they they all uh, did their own thing, and that's, that's why they were as great as they were, you know. And I'm hopeful that all, all those guys uh, get in there because they certainly uh, deserve it. I agree 100%. I have a, I have a question, Bruce, but first I have a statement. Uh, well, I think, I think what, I, I think the big sign of the respect, uh, WWE put out a, a big DVD set, 20 Greatest Rawls of All Time. Well, one of the Rawls is the Raw from Germany in the night that Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith wrestled each other for the European Championship. It was the first European title match. It was the finals. And it was one of the best wrestling matches that ever aired on television. Uh, from bell to bell, those two guys just went in there and it just really tore the house down. And I agree with you 100%. All those talents that you mentioned should be in the Hall of Fame. Real quick question. It's been it's been talked about, talked about, talked about. Brett, years of frustration, uh, leaving the WWE. Uh, in 2010, something was worked out, and he returned. Uh, you were involved in that at WrestleMania, Bruce. Uh, okay, so sitting back in the family after years of, of all this, just one bad thing after, after another happening, everybody has seen the Heart and Soul DVD, and it's, it's a really tragic story but for Brett to go back and have that moment you're involved the family's involved your dad gets inducted uh, how did it make you were you happy to see 
you know, people come together and say, okay, it is what it is. It happened. Let's try to put a let's try to put a a, a key in the lock and lock up this this bad blood. Let's let's do something again. Were you happy about that? Um, I had mixed vibes about it. You know, I uh, on the one sense, you know, I, I had been advocating. Uh, you know, years before that, you know, burying the hatchet, I didn't see any, uh, you know, it was obviously, uh, you know, pretty, you know, serious and uh, you know, incredible loss and all like that with Owen, but uh, I didn't see any point in uh, carrying, you know, they say one of the heaviest burdens one could carry is a grudge and uh I didn't see there was any great point in uh, prolonging all the animosity. So uh, for a long time, Brett was the uh, guy who was uh, most adamant about uh, you know not burying the hatchet with all and so with Finney and WWE and all like that. So I thought it was uh, long overdue, and I. Uh, I give some props to Vince. You know, I, I think his heart was in the right place for uh, extending the olive branch or uh, endeavoring to uh, kind of, in, in his own way, um, you know, kind of build a bridge over troubled water with not only inducting Brett, but... Um, my dad as well, you know. It was too bad my dad wasn't alive to enjoy it. But um, I, I, I uh, thought the whole thing was, uh, you know, uh, in my estimation for for the right reasons. I thought the match itself, I was frankly quite disappointed in it. I remember when they called us in and gave us the uh, the lowdown for that match. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as I heard it, I thought it was frankly a bunch of crap. <laughs> and I told them that too when they ran the uh, finish by us with uh, Brett uh, beating the crap out of Vince with chairs and claw bars and nut shots <laughs> and all, all of that good stuff. The excellence of execution and the supposed best technical wrestler, the best there is or ever will be, or whatever, you know, uh, doing nothing but claw bars and nut shots and chair shots. <laughs> you know, I remember when they ran the finish by us, uh, I think it was Michael Hayes giving it to us. Uh, they asked me what I thought, and I I think they're accustomed to everyone obsequiously blowing smoke up their sphincters, but I, I, uh, I said just from my casual perspective, I think it sucks. <laughs> you know, uh, he got Brett, uh, who's supposedly the uh, you know preeminent technical wrestler of this generation, doing nothing but nut shots and beating Vince with a chair, and then I said there was no ebb or flow to the whole thing, you know. And um, just off the top of my head, I I told him, that, you know, that from my perspective, it made more sense to. Uh, Maybe have Vinny get some heat on Brett, and given that Brett had supposedly uh, it's his first match back since his stroke, and then they had done some, you know, charade about a couple of weeks before that with Brett getting injured in the back in a limo accident or some contrived crap, you know. So, so I said, you have all that going down, plus, uh, you know. Just off the top of my head, I noticed that Sean and Hunter had some kind of a, a falling out at Royal Rumble, which cost uh, like one of them uh, shot at the world title. So I said, it's just off the top of my head, it may, you know, uh, I could see a finish where uh, Brett was selling his ass off initially for Vince, you know, since his first match back since he's had the stroke and play up the drama, you know, is Brett going to survive this? And given that Vinny's the uh, ultra villain and all like that anyway, and I said finally Brett rallies and uh, gets his uh, sharpshooter on Vinny and uh, at that point have Stephanie, uh, you know, come running to the ring, take the ref because 
daddy's getting, uh, you know, uh, annihilated, and then at that point have Hunter hit the ring and uh, be about to give Brett the pedigree, and uh, at which point, you know, they have the hell freezes over uh, scenario with Shawn Michaels hitting the ring and uh, saving Brett, and uh, I told him it made, you know, would be an intriguing combination of Brett and Sean against uh, Benny and Hunter in a tag, you know, say for SummerSlam or something. Um, oddly enough, they, they all seem pretty keen on the whole thing, so Brett kind of, you know, claimed that he couldn't uh, have another match because of his Lloyds of London uh, charade or his policy or something like that. But, so, but yeah, that's sort of... Uh, long-winded uh, <laughs> uh, answer to that about that, that whole thing, you know. But, yeah, I, I, I was, as I said before, uh, I thought it was a, a good, you know, uh, initiative on Vinny's part to uh, try to right some of the wrongs, you know. You know, it's, can't bring Owen back, but, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, I, if you can kind of, uh, you know, mend some of the, uh, you know, kind of the wounds, you know, from the past. And I think Owen being inducted into the Hall of Fame would be a step in that direction, too. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Mike, are you there? All right. I'm right here, man. We are getting close to the top of the hour, and unfortunately we are going to have to wrap this up soon. But I did have one more question for you. You've been talking about um, the need for the territories and young up-and-coming guys need a place to be able to go and to work and to gain some experience. Who are some of the people that you see now maybe on the indie circuit or um, TNA or WWE currently and all that? Who are some of the people you see that you think are the – are going to be hitting up. They're going to be the next level. They're going to be the future. Is there anyone out there that kind of gets your attention that you think is going to be There's like the next guys, big you know, I just, Quite honestly, I just from what I hear, I can't say I've seen some of them, but I've heard really good things about a guy named Bobby Ocean who's apparently down in the East Coast. And uh, another guy that's been doing the NXT, a guy named Rick Victor, who I hear, you know, he, he trained up here with us back in the days. I thought, you know, and uh, some of the guys that uh, have sort of been up for the uh, proverbial cup of coffee with Vinny and then went back, you know, I, I thought John Morrison had a lot more potential and they let him uh, manifest. And, um, you know, it's, I think if they brought him back and used him a bit better, he'd be another, you know, great guy. Or Same with my nephew, Harry. I thought he was uh, completely wasted in his earlier stint in WWE and he's doing fine in Japan now yeah but he's got a way more talent than I ever saw them let him uh bring to the surface in uh WWE and there's kids up here my own kids are really uh you know they're every bit as talented as Brett and Owen were at that same age you know so I could see them uh you know, rising to the occasion if they ever get a shot, you know. And that that's the thing that the business needs more of right now. They need, uh, I see these guys uh, prematurely being, you know, introduced to, in WWE, some of these big uh, guys like Biggie Langston and Ezekiel and, uh, you know, uh, Ryback and guys like that. And uh, some of them have an awesome look in the... Uh, get over pretty good the first time or two, but, you know, the one thing they're lacking is they haven't had any place to uh, learn learn how to work. And then it becomes painfully obvious after a few matches, and then they seem to just uh, kill them off after that, you know, which isn't fair to them either, you know. There, there should all, uh, that's one of the other things that they need, you know, uh, territories or places, you know, I see all too often these guys after they sort of, uh, you know, run out of guys to work with and all, they, they just start squashing or they just sort of die on the vine. And, I, you know, it's 
instead they should just send them out. In the old days, you know, uh, you'd have guys, uh, you know, they'd run their course and have their run in a circuit, and then they'd go to another place and be a star somewhere else and come back a year later and they'd still be hot. But nowadays I see all these guys, I'm even seeing it right now with guys like Dolph Ziegler and uh, Ryback and some of those guys just sort of almost being uh, jobbed or uh, losing their edge. It'd uh, be better if they just sent them someplace where they could, uh, you know, regain their edge and come back six months later. It's sort of like what they've done with Batista, you know. Batista was sort of dying on the vine about five years ago, and now, now they brought him back. But it was mostly because he retired back in the day, but... That's something I think they uh, they need to have. Uh, and the other thing I would say is it serves no purpose to have these guys breaking in on a place like NXT, you know, you know, exposing all their kind of imperfections. You know, it used to be when you brought a guy in, you know, uh, they have to hit the ground running as like a awe-inspiring superstar when they get there, you know. If you have them, uh, you know, learning uh, and being uh, scrutinized while they're in NXT and then they try to bring them in as stars, everyone's already seen them, you know, with all their warts and imperfections. This kind of contradicts the whole, you know, purpose. All right. Well, thank you for that very candid answer. And we have very much enjoyed talking with you tonight, Bruce. We are unfortunately at the top of the hour. We are going to have to bring this to a close as we head into our second hour. Um, I would like to say we would like to have you back on again sometime to hear some more stories about, you know, Stuart, you know, your father, the, the family, the dungeon, Hart Brothers University. Um, yeah, I appreciate the uh, buying and uh, it's been nice talking to you. If, if there's any uh, people out there that are uh, you think have some potential uh let us know and uh if there's anyone out there listening that uh is serious about getting into wrestling uh we'd love to hear from them you know we're uh in the process as i said of you know re on the seeds at the grassroots and we got things really uh rocking and rolling up here right now so i'm i'm very confident we'll have another generation of people like brett and dynamite and davy and pillman and on and Benoit and Liger and all like that up here, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, if there's anyone out there that's serious about wrestling, uh, you know, love to hear from them, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, be happy to uh, get them started. All right, well, if you have any contact information, um, you can send it to me or to David, and we'll get that out on the air for you. I'm sure there's got to be some people out there that would jump at that opportunity. And as I said, um, yeah, this is I said as I said, this is a real deal. This is uh, you know, you know, I, I'm saddened to see it, but there's not too many places anymore that uh, you know, there's not too many of the old guard left. So. If they're serious about the business, I always hate to sound like I'm talking about old school because almost all the guys, uh, I, I don't want people thinking we're talking about wool tights and black boots. You know, Most of the guys I'm talking about were as dynamic and spectacular and cutting edge as it gets. You know, the Owens and the Benoits and the Pillmans and the, some of those guys, Dynamite. So you know, we're pretty uh, cutting edge as far as... Uh, type of wrestling or the style so I hope they recognize that alright well Bruce it's been great talking to you and like I said we'll have you on again soon uh, thank you for joining us this evening all the best guys you take care Thanks. thank you sir See you too thank you alright everyone that was Bruce Hart from Hart Brothers University and the Hart family Great to have him on as a guest. We will definitely have him on again soon. Uh, Brian, I hear you're still on the air. Thank you for joining up with me earlier tonight to help out. David's here now. Uh, like I said, if you'd like to stick around, you got a couple questions for Billy, feel free. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Anyway, David, right, you have a good 
jump up on your little soapbox and make you feel yourself feel about five feet taller. So anything on your mind tonight? Anything you'd like to talk about? Anytime I can feel five feet taller, it is a good day. <laughs> All right, now I just want to. Uh, we had a big announcement this past week. Uh, we're gonna uh, we're we're gonna be announcing our 2015 IHWE Hall of Fame class in the upcoming week. Uh, we want to get the announcement. We want to get the people out there as soon as possible. We don't wait around. And of course, the big announcement a few weeks ago was the Bon Eric family is being inducted as a family into the Hall of Fame, the Texas Wrestling Hall of Fame, which is really big. Uh, this Hall of Fame was started years ago. It turned out very small. Faced a lot of scrutiny. Still does, but it's okay. I had a long conversation with Troy Peterson, and he is a part of the Dan Gable Museum and, and Waterloo. And he, he told me something very important. He said, don't let anybody discourage us. He said, there's still people out there who discourage us, and we've been doing this for years. So don't let anybody out there discourage you. So, uh, you know... Uh, so, you know, that was very – that was nice to hear. Uh, so uh, we do this because we love the business. It's, it's, it's a day to embrace, honor our legends of Texas. And I was very happy to announce Tim Storm, who has been wrestling here in Texas for years. He is the current traditional championship wrestling champion. We're going to be seen every week on the Pursuit Channel – and in about 100 different markets across the United States, uh, TCWWrestling.com, Traditional Championship Wrestling, if you want to see Tim Storm. And he's going to be the newest member of the IHWE Texas Wrestling Hall of Fame in 2015. I met Tim in 2001. He's a, he's a gentleman with a lot of character. He's an awesome performer. He's a really good man, and he's going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And we will have other names for you in the upcoming weeks and also – we're going to plan on getting everybody on as guests also. Uh, coming up next week, we have Rob Sandberger, who's a critically acclaimed wrestling artist. He takes his passion for wrestling, his incredible talent for art, and combines them. And I believe today or yesterday, his paintings were on WWE. They were on the WWE auction site. He had pictures of Kobe Kingston and other superstars with paintings he had done of them. And you can go on the... WWE auction page and bid on them, which is really, really cool. Rob's going to be on here next week, the following week, February 19th. We have Kevin Von Eric, 2015 IHWE Wrestling Hall of Famer, member of the Von Eric Dynasty down here in Texas. He's going to be a guest in the February 26th. Michael is going to be involved with an upcoming show, I believe, in California. We're going to be talking about that. And we're going to do something really cool. We're going to uh, actually air a archived interview that I conducted in 2008 with 2011 IHW Hall of Famer, my friend, the late, great General Skandar Akbar. Uh, Akbar called in that day. We talked for about 15 minutes. He was very cool. And actually, that the day that he called, I believe, was just a few weeks after Gary Hart had passed away. <laughs> so we'll get to hear – you actually you know, get to hear Akbar's thoughts on Gary Hart's passing – after they happened, and you'll get to hear Ack being Ack. Uh, if anybody, if, if people didn't get to hear him just talk and not in a wrestling promo, there's not much difference. The voice is still the same. He was really, really cool, and uh, one of the one of one of the finer things in life I did, one of the better things in life I did, was I got to hang out with General Skandar Akbar. So uh, that will be on here on February 26th, and then come March. We'll get, be getting ready for WrestleMania. We'll be getting ready for the uh, IHWE Hall of Fame. And uh, off and on, we'll be having guests that the Cauliflower Alley Club on to get ready for that in June. So a lot of good things coming on. You got something you want to promote? Get with me. Get with Michael. Come on here like Bruce Hart just did. It was really cool having Bruce Hart on here. But nothing's really on my mind, dude. I mean, the same thing's been going around. Uh, you know, CM Punk still, you know, chilling. Doing his thing. Uh, you know, not a whole lot. I think things are going to pan out, hopefully. We're excited about the network. It's really cool to get to watch all that good wrestling. So, uh, I'm good. Like I said, you said to run my son to the doctor. He's fine. But, uh, I mean, leave you guys hanging. But, uh, you know, it's cool. I get it. Can't live without me, Michael. I, I get it. It's cool. I understand. <laughs> In a few weeks, you'll be taking over this show. So, it's all good. No, 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 no. 
You're you're st- you're staying with me, man. We're we're in this together. You're not leaving me. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, we should be waiting for Bill to be calling in any minute, Bill Anderson. So while we're waiting on him, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just banter. This is live radio. Oh, I believe we have a caller on right now. I believe that's Bill. All right, Michael, take it away. All right. Um, hopefully you are correct. We are on the Wonders of Live Radio. <laughs> I believe we are being joined by our second guest of the evening. Uh, Bill, is this you? Yes, sir, it sure is. All right, yes, ladies and gentlemen, Phoenix, we are joined Arizona. by... <laughs> Hello, Bill. We are being joined by Hello. Bill Anderson. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be on the show, and I appreciate you guys having me on. Oh, any time. We're glad to have you. Um, I was telling some of the listeners earlier, uh, you've got two books out, I believe. One is The School of Wrestling, and the other one is Big Bill Anderson Remembers the Fallen Friends of Wrestling. You also, yes. I believe, have a book coming out, correct? I'm working on a third book. It's actually a non-wrestling book. Uh I'm kind of uh, torn between uh, working on another wrestling book and a and a book that's actually on Hollywood history. Uh, I'm big on the old days of Hollywood, uh, which is totally non-wrestling related on this show. <laughs> but uh, I have a passion for the old Hollywood actors and uh, some of their mysterious deaths and, and some macabre things like that that have happened in old Hollywood. But uh, uh, my books on wrestling I find are, are pretty interesting, and um, uh, especially this last one I did, which was my uh, – the book is a tribute to fallen wrestlers that have passed away and uh, to 27 people that I had the space to write about in this first book about that subject and uh, great men like Red Bastine and and uh, Road Warrior Hawk and the Big Boss Man and Randy Savage and Andre the Giant and Bruiser Brody – and it really it goes on and on, some just greats of, of the business that were friends of mine that I spent time with on the road. And I uh, wrestled many of these guys. Uh, and Red Bastine and I shared an apartment together back in the old days. I'm sorry? We seem to be picking up some background noise here. I'm not quite sure what that was. Sorry, guys. I had, I had my phone mute. I was talking to my wife, like I said. So uh, continue. <laughs> we are professionals, ladies and gentlemen. This is live radio. We are professionals. <laughs> this is what makes our show better than anybody else's because you don't know what's going to happen. Because we do go off the cuff. Yeah, yeah it's the world, the world of chaos. The honor to have you on. Uh, we've talked over the past few days. We talked about Johnny Valentine and such. It's really yeah. cool to, to speak to you. Uh, so, when. Breaking into the business, when did you do it? How did it come about? Who did you meet to break into the business? Tell us, tell, tell our listeners about that. Okay, well, I started out uh, just as a regular wrestling fan like so many of the boys did in the old days and probably still do. And this was in 1973 here in Phoenix, where I live uh, now. And uh, Kurt Von Steiger, who was part of a brother tag team, a Kurt and Carl Von Steiger, uh, Kurt is the, the man that trained me in 73. And it really started kind of as a fluke almost because I just happened to be late getting picked up from one of his wrestling shows he was promoting in Phoenix. And he asked me to help uh, tear the ring down because him and his wife were doing it by themselves. So I started helping with the ring, and one thing led to another, and I realized uh, he would train me for wrestling, and I trained with him. And uh, uh, Bobby Jaggers uh, was one of the students in that class, and so was uh, Sita. Uh, from the Wild Samoans, he was part of our class too, back in '73, and uh, and that's how I broke in with to Kurt Von Steiger uh, here in Phoenix. And then I had my first match in 1974, uh, and then uh, kind of went from there, and then went to Tennessee in 1975, working for Jerry Jarrett and Nick Goulas, and that was a great experience for me. Uh, which was um, really the catalyst for why I, when I had the opportunity with Red Bastine to train Sting in the Ultimate Warrior in 1985, I had an opportunity to send them guys to work for uh, Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett at the time. They had sent photos in, and they said, do you recommend us going down there? And I said, I recommend that area very highly. I said, uh, I, I kind of got my start there in my rookie year, and I said, 
it's a great place to get experience in the South there. Uh, you wrestle a good variety of guys. You wrestle every night of the week, and that's the experience you need. And I think that's what really helped lay the groundwork for, for Steve Borden and Jim Helwig to do as well future that they were able to do was laying the groundwork in Tennessee, working for Jarrett and uh, Lawler. So that's kind now of like where I up, started, you know. <laughs> now, you brought up uh, the Ultimate Warrior and Sting. We were talking about both of them earlier this evening. Um, what? Two questions. One, what is your opinion on Sting sometime coming to the WWE? Do you think that would be a good move for him? And also, what is your thoughts on the Ultimate Warrior going into the Hall of Fame this year? As you said, you did train both of these men, so right. I would assume you have kind of kept tabs on it. You know, I maybe stay in contact well, with him. But your opinions on all this? I've seen Sting at some uh, Athletes International Ministry conferences through the years. We've stayed in touch far better than I have with Jim Helwig. Uh, who I guess is just the warrior now. I guess that's his legal name. I don't know, Jim Warrior or something like that. Here, here's my opinion. I There is absolutely no denying the attendance that uh, Jim, or let's just say the Ultimate Warrior set, attendance records Jim set wrestling against Paul Orndorff and against Hulk Hogan and things like that. He drew houses. There's no doubt about that. Uh, he had his outs with Vince, no, no different than many people have. Uh, which is why Randy Savage hadn't been put in for all these years for that same reason. So there's no denying that Jim Helwig is, is qualified to be in the Hall of Fame as uh, as a lot of people are. I mean, he he, he did some uh, good money numbers for Vince. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, uh, as far as Sting going into WWF or WWE at this time, it's kind of a – I have a weird feeling about it because, first of all, Steve Borden is uh, hes a lot older. He's uh, at the very end of his career, let's face it. I mean, he's in good shape. There's no doubt about it. But he's toward the end of his career. Uh, he's obviously going to have to work a lighter schedule. But Vince isn't going to put him on the road every day. That was one of the things that kept Steve from doing this all these years, is he didn't want to be on the road every day away from his family. He's a good family man, and uh, he respects his wife and kids, and he wants to be with them, and he loves them. So... To go on the road full-time, I don't see that happening. I've never seen that happening with Steve. He's a unique individual. He doesn't uh, play by everybody else's rules. kind of sets his own rules. No different than the Warrior did in his own way. So uh, I think if Vince gets him, which Vince has always wanted him because it's a good coup for him to get finally get Sting after all these years, no, doubt, no doubting what Sting's uh, past record has been in the business. He, he was, you know, multi-time world champion. He, he did his own thing very well for himself. Good man. And uh, But I just don't see him working full-time for Vince, whatever that is. Uh, I just don't see it. Maybe on some uh, better schedule than, like, The Undertaker has, one match a year, five matches a year, whatever he's got. He'll, but he'll be on a limited schedule. I, I just don't see it any other way. Yeah, That's my opinion. Have... Yeah, let me let me jump in here. I agree 100%, Bill. Uh, first of all, the ultimate warrior. Okay, folks, uh, you want to talk about the Hall of Fame. Okay, here, here's my two cents. I'm a longtime wrestling fan, like Bill was, broke into the business years ago. Uh, Bill has had the wonderful opportunity to actually have a hand in the warrior things, you know, getting to where they're at, which is awesome. The ultimate warrior, Bill is correct. He sold tickets. He drew houses. He is one of those characters that everybody remembers when they were a kid. He's one of those characters like Hogan, like Andre, like Jake, like Macho Man. He's one of those characters that we all grew up in love. We didn't, when we were kids, we didn't care if he went 25 minutes every night. We didn't care about work rate. Jim had a different edge. It doesn't mean he was a bad worker, because when Jim was in there with somebody who could... Jim was good at certain things and some things, hey... There's a lot of guys in this business that need a little help getting through good matches. It doesn't lessen their value. One of the greatest matches of all time is Randy Savage and the Ultimate Warrior from WrestleMania 7. The career match. This is one of those matches with so much emotion. I love that match. And I'll put that match up against any other match from that era. Jim went in there with Hogan and had a really good match. I think Jim needs to be recognized. 
any time two people who've had bad blood for years can put it aside, come together, and have a moment. In this business, we lose somebody almost every day. So any time that people can come together and say, you know what, yeah, we had heat, let's get past it, let's do something nice, I think it's wonderful. So for Jim to get a moment, the speech is going to be worse. I hope it's on the network. I want to see the Warriors' speech. That's going to be fantastic. I'm glad you guys <laughs> It should be WWE. interesting. <laughs> yeah, and as far as Steve goes, I agree. He's not going to be on the road full time. He's not going to be Daniel Bryan. But I would love to see yeah, exactly. Sting finish up. I would love to see Sting finish up in the WWE. He can get his Hall of Fame induction. We can get a legitimate DVD right. release with a documentary with a lot of his matches. And I just for he tried so hard, and he put so many years in the TNA. God bless him for that. He didn't go for the mm-hmm. money. He went to help a company. But I've never heard a bad thing about Sting. Never heard a bad thing about him. Right. So for, well, uh, you know that loyalty. That loyalty came from when he worked for uh, Jarrett's uh, Jeff Jarrett's dad. That's right. where that loyalty came from to begin with. And Steve is a, a, a man of his word, and, and he really felt very committed to that promotion for so many years. That has just been, in my humble opinion, so mismanaged yeah. over those last several years. I don't care what you do, you never, never let uh, 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 AJ, uh, what's his name? I'm sorry, AJ, AJ, uh, Styles. AJ, AJ Styles. Styles. You never let him go from your company, ever. Correct. He was one hell of a wrestler. One of my yeah, favorites that I used to love to watch. Exactly. You never well, let him go. You give him what he wants and keep him. To let him go is He's a, was a tragic of mistake. TNA. He's the Sting. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The franchise of and, TNA, yeah. yeah. They, they just didn't know what they were doing. But, you know, your points about both Sting and Warrior are right on the money. I agree with you 100%. Because, you know, let's face it, when was the last time you saw Georgie Animal Steel back in the 60s and 70s have a classic match? That wasn't the point. He was a character. And that's what drew money, and people loved to see it. I love to see it, you know, and everything. That's the same way Jim Jim was. And don't and don't ever think for a minute that Jim didn't learn holds and training, learn how to do drop kicks, learn how to do this, learn how to do that. No different than Sting did. The Angel of Death, Dave Sheldon was in this class. Uh, Strangler Steve DeSalvo was in this class. They all learned how to wrestle. What their gimmicks became is what a lot of promoters kind of pushed on them and just figured this is the best way out of whatever situation, use this gimmick with this guy. But Jim knew how to wrestle. Was he ever going to put a top wrist lock on anybody? No, he's, he didn't need to. Vince would have been right. upset with him if he had done it. Right. And that's why his gimmick was run to the ring. And I, and I worked on a hundred shows in a row probably where he did the, the thing with Andre the Giant where he pinned him before like the bell even rang out here. Right. You know, on the West Coast especially, they did those in every arena. And it was like a five, six, seven, eight, ten second match. That was the gimmick. That was what it was. It wasn't supposed to be a Bob Backlund match. <laughs> it was well, the gimmick. You know, of, you know? Right. Yeah. Andre at that point, he couldn't get those kind of match. He couldn't get oh, through the match yeah. unless it was like yeah. Hey, God yeah. bless Andre. I, Andre is they, one of the exactly. greatest. He's the reason I started watching wrestling. He's one of the greatest attractions yeah. of all time. No and for doubt him about to go it. in there. And give Jim the rub. It's fantastic. And Bill, much of what you were saying, how many wrestlers have we seen over the years that go in there and give us those thirty minute matches that apply those top wrist locks? But a lot of them, what do they miss? They miss that that it thing to draw the money, and that's what Jim could do. Exactly. You're you're exactly right. You're exactly right. You know, you think back into the eighties, I'll tell you like a, a quick draw Rick McGraw or a Terry Gibbs or some of the for opening match guys that Vince used in the 80s, early 80s, they could outwork Jim five times over, but they never drew a dime. And that's that's no slight to them. It's just part of the, what life is. You know, everybody can't be the star of a movie. You're always going to have your cast that goes way down the list to the 30th person listed in that number. And that's just where some people are. And Jim had the it ability. You're right. Jim knew how to draw people. And 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 uh, whether it's steroid related or whatever, that's the price his body will pay down the road or whatever 
if and if that is the fact. I can't say it is or not. I never saw him do it. Who knows? That goes with Hogan or goes with any of them, for that matter. So, But they drew money, and there's no denying it. And let's face it, look at Bruno Sammartino, who was a complete legend in the business. He gave in last year and did the Hall of Fame thing. And and it's just, like you said, it's really it's the, for the best of the business that a lot of these guys do it because what kind of a Hall of Fame is it without some of these guys in it, especially Bruno? Right. You yeah. know, Bruno belonged in there if anybody ever did. Champion from 70, uh, 63 to 71, uninterrupted, alone. Right. That's, that's just the incredible run he had that no one could ever do again. It will never be duplicated in the history of our business, ever. And But those were the days. And Bruno Bruno uh, was a draw and uh, and a hell of a guy. And, and he had the charisma. And he had the Italian people and everybody else behind him in, in the New York and New England area in particular in those days. But, you know, there's I'll no say one more thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're, yeah. I'll say one more thing and I'll hand it over back to Michael. Uh, that's what makes our business beautiful is – our show, well, I say our show, the the show has guys who can go in there from bell to bell, put on all the holes, and then there's guys like the Warrior, there's guys like Hogan, there's guys like Cena, there's guys like that who go in there, they put on a show, it's a different kind of match, but they're, they connect with the fans more. There's nothing wrong with a guy who can go in there and go 45 minutes and apply every wrestling hole that ever was put out. There's nothing wrong with that, and there's nothing wrong with a guy who can go on there, yell at the TV, yell at the people at home, and make them go, hey, let's go down to the armory Friday night and see this guy. This guy's crazy. <laughs> there's just a variety, and that's what makes our business better than anything else. We have a variety of performers. Exactly. I agree 100%. That's the way it especially used to be, uh, far more than I think today it is, but that's you know that's just my opinion. I just uh, uh, I love the business as it used to be because not everybody looked the same on a card. You had your Ox Bakers or your or Haystacks Calhouns or whatever. You had the Midgets, which are an obsolete part of the business almost anymore. You know, right. and and you had you had real women wrestlers that knew how to wrestle and weren't all silicone too. No offense yeah, right. to some of the great ladies that are out there today, but it's just the way it is. You know. Uh, Mula wasn't considered eye candy, but could she work? Hell yeah, she could. And uh, and a lot of girls just like her. You know, I I was in love with a lot of those women back in those days when my when I started. And Casey, well, late, well, ladies, young, the ladies were the yeah, one of the best. Oh yeah, and May was a beautiful woman in her younger days, and she was yeah. one hell of a tough wrestler. There's a lot of them, and I love the old women wrestlers. You know, they were they were great, a great attraction to a show, and they weren't just used as TNA. Not TNA promotion, but TNA to, to just approve around the ring and be silicone right, out right. there. Yeah, right. and, and, and that's what I miss a little bit about the business, uh, the way it used to be. And uh, I just miss the old characters, you know, and, and the way it is now, no denying a guy like Daniel Bryan is just one hell of a wrestler. And, and, and an AJ Styles, those kind of guys are great. It's just, you know, it's still, you need some of the characters, you know, of the business. That's what made pro wrestling what it was, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, I kind of missed that. I didn't have a gimmick, personally. I was just an all-American kind of skinny kid when I first started, before I started working under a mask and things like that in Mexico and Japan. But I, I was just, I didn't have a fancy gimmick. And because you've got to go with what your body is allowing you to go with. Some people have natural charisma to go in a certain direction and others don't. And uh, uh, Warrior, you know, God bless the guy, man. He took off on, with what Vince and him figured out was the best way for him to work his, his gimmick and his body style and everything, and uh, he made a hell of a lot of money, and so did Vince from it. And uh, and the people were entertained. And the same goes with a guy like superstar Billy Graham, you know, and, right. and, and, and a lot of these guys. And I'm, I'm seeing Billy tomorrow. I'm having a lunch with superstar. And, and these guys knew what it was about and how to have charisma. Well, Billy's right. 72 years old. He still has charisma. I, he, he attracts crowds in the restaurant we go to every time. He can cut you know, a and, better than half the guys on TV. <laughs> he certainly can. He certainly can. And, uh, uh, and it's just uh, it's just amazing, you know. But that that was the way it was. And, you know, I'm a little more old school than I am current on, on current topic uh, with a lot of this, what's going on. 
but I am aware, like I, like you said, about Jim going into the Hall of Fame and Sting signing and things like that. I think I think it's I think it's wonderful uh, for the fans. There's some matchups that have never been done before. Uh, that their fans are going to see some cool things in the future. And uh, Steve loves the business. He has great respect for the business. So it's, it's going to be fantastic. Now, you're talking charisma. Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> you're okay. talking charisma and all that. You mentioned superstar and all that. I'm glad to hear he's doing well. Um, just a quick little story i got to share. I haven't had a chance to tell David this one. Um, Billy, do you remember just... Oh, God, two, three years ago at the Call for Hour reunion, I believe it was you, Superstar, myself, ODB, Awesome Kong, at DGI yeah. Friday until, yeah. what was it, four in the morning? The waiters <laughs> were afraid to tell Superstar we had to leave. <laughs> yeah, and you don't want to know what happened at the beginning of that cauliflower in that restaurant with the girls that came up to us. <laughs> Wanting autographs, it was pretty crazy. We won't talk about that on the air, though. But, but Michael, I'll, I'll be happy to tell you about it when I see you. <laughs> Some craziness. I that. <laughs> but I just but, remember, uh, you know, you yeah. all sitting there. Waiters would come in and try to, oh, well, we're trying to. Superstar would just say a couple words here and there, and they just walk away. He basically ran that we were the only people in that restaurant at one point. They finally had to come in and tell us they had to close for a couple hours to clean up. They finally had to kick us yeah. out. Yes, yes, yes. I remember that. I was rooming with them. God help me. Yes, I remember. <laughs> that was a, that was a quite insane uh, few days. That was in uh, 2009. That was like four years ago. It's hard to believe it was that long ago. Uh, that was it that long? It was, yeah, that was the yeah, weekend yeah. that... Uh, I had my encounter with the Iron Sheik, which was due in part to Superstar oh, Billy Graham. Oh, we all have an encounter with the Iron Sheik, myself included. <laughs> I had an encounter with him that same week wondering. during. <laughs> Very good, thanks. And I, I, uh, you know, I was on the outs with Iron Sheik, like a lot of people have been over the years. And I thought, I thought he didn't like me, and I thought I didn't like him. And that weekend, uh, we kind of made up. And I was very happy about it because, again, in a much smaller scale than anything Vince McMahon does, it, it was something that you have to put aside disagreements in the ring and things that happened. And uh, uh, we had an argument myself and the Sheik many years ago in California on a show back in the mid-'90s. And uh, um, it was just absolutely amazing when he saw that I was sitting with uh, with Billy Graham that actually at the, at the, before the banquet at the baloney blowout there. Billy says, "Hey, uh, Sheik, you know you know my friend Bill Anderson here." And he goes, "Bill, I, oh, you you gotta love my my Iron Sheik invitation." He goes, "Bill Anderson, Bill Anderson, I know I love Bill Anderson. Where is Bill Anderson? Where is he?" And she, Billy goes, "He's stay, he right here." And he goes, "Oh my God!" And he comes over and gives me a kiss on the cheek and everything. And it was like I thought we hated each other, and turns out we loved each other. That's the business. That's the CAC, the Ring of Friendship, and that it, I think that that tells you more about what Cauliflower Alley Club could do than anything else. Is it can put a, like like there they say you put aside your differences and you become friends there, and uh, whether real or imaginary uh, 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 differences of opinion, they you become friends there. And I have done that time and time again with people through the years. Because uh, I've been in the business, you know, for almost 40 years, off and on here, and uh, I, it's just you come across people that you think you didn't like or didn't like you, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're hugging and kissing, and and it's like you become long lost buddies, and I love it. I love it. In fact, six months later, I had a picture of Sheik hanging up in my bedroom of all things of me and him together. I never thought you couldn't have told me that you would have paid me twenty thousand dollars to have hung a picture of him up a year before. And it would have been impossible for me to imagine. And there I am. There I'm hanging a picture of. There's me and Sheik. You know, and it was just because uh, you become friends and you are friends. And uh, you put aside your differences. No difference than Vince and, uh, and with, with, the, with uh, Bruno last year, with um, Ultimate Warrior this year. It's good business. It really is. And uh, I'm happy that uh, I was able to do that. Yeah, it's interesting right. you talk no. about the Columbara Alley Club. And 
like say, in April 2012, I received the Red Bastion Friendship Award, and I was the last person to receive it while Red was still alive. And I think uh, Gordy Enko had told me Carol was in the audience. She was tears streaming down her face when I mentioned him in my wow. speech. And, of course, we lost Red August 11, 2012, 81, Alzheimer's. Yeah. And now this year, John Arthur Lowe, he's going to be the first person to receive the award since Bastine's death. I mean, can you mention a little bit about Red and just how much of an influence he's been? I mean, I had no idea how much love he had for the boys in tangible and non-tangible ways. I mean, the Texas shootout coming out, that was something he yeah. started. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Red, you know, I first met Red in 1984, I want to say. Maybe it was 83. When Vince first expanded to California, it was actually in March of 83. Because uh, I worked on um, all the shows, WWF shows in the West Coast. We were, they were doing Sacramento, San Francisco, Oakland, Fresno, Bakersfield, L.A., San Diego, Anaheim, Long Beach, a whole series of cities. And Red came out uh, as a road agent, uh, originally like with Chief J. Strongbow and Rene Goulet and Jack Lanza and several different guys. And that's where I first met Red. And I just, what I remember when I first met him was when Red spoke, everybody listened in the dressing room. Of course, it was a great group of boys in those days. You know, you had Bob Backlund and Greg Valentine. So everybody knew who Red Bastine was. But everyone listened and Red didn't have to talk long and talk loud. When he said something, they listened. And I became very close with Red during this time. I, I looked at him uh, as a father figure, as an older brother, however you want to say it. I looked at him as my mentor. He gave me a lot of sound advice uh, and um, uh, got me on some bo independent bookings. Uh, he was involved with some things with uh, Playboy Buddy Rose up in the San Francisco area, some shows, and he had me and uh, a bunch of guys drive from Southern California up to the Bay Area for some shows with Steve Party and uh, Buddy Rose and Alexis Smirnoff and a lot of guys. And Red just became a real good friend. And when I was going through a divorce in 1985, uh, I was living back here in Phoenix at the time, and I called Red, and, and I was still I was flying back and forth for WWF shows to California because I was wrestling on these shows at that time. Uh, before I later became a ring announcer for them also. And Red, I said, Red, I want to come back to California. i got nowhere to stay. Uh, can you suggest anything? And he said, Brother, I've got one hell of a big one-bedroom apartment, and i got two beds in my bedroom. You are more than welcome to live with me for as long as you need. And that's the kind of guy Red was. Took me right in, and I moved back to, over to uh, uh, Los Angeles, lived with Red, and Red says, I'm, I'm putting a class together. I got... I got uh, uh, Rick Bassman has uh, given me a check for uh, to train some guys. He says, I can't physically get in the ring and do it a lot anymore. Got artificial hips. And uh, he, like Red always said, the mind is willing, but the body isn't. And he says, I, could, I can talk their way through a lot, but I need a guy in there to take bumps for these guys. I need a guy in there that's young and agile and can work with him. And I got, I got six great athletes that are in there, and I need somebody to work. And he says, will you do me that honor and get in the ring with these guys and he says, you've got a free place to stay and uh, for as long as you need it and get in there and train with these guys. And I said, sure, Red, whatever you need, brother. And we work with these guys, and that's the kind of influence Red had on me. I, I would do whatever the man asked me. Uh, I, I, dro I drove, I, for a $50 payoff, I drove uh, 1,200 miles one time for him each way. <laughs> I mean, tell, wow. tell, who, who would do that? But you know what? That's just the way the business was in those days. You did crazy things. And whatever Red asked me to do, I felt there was a reason behind it or Red wouldn't have asked. And uh, I just, uh, I can't tell you how many times I was around Red where we laughed until we cried. Uh, we, uh, we just were, uh, we bonded with each other so well. And Red was just a hero to me. Never got to see the man wrestle live like I did so many other guys in the business or wrestle on shows with them. Red was one that uh, escaped my career, my part of my career. But where I was at, he was at another part of the country. And uh, But I tell you what, I've seen matches of Reds on, on tapes. He was just one hell of a worker. His flying head scissors is unequaled by anybody. 
And uh, Red is just my hero. And uh, when he became president of CAC, uh, it was a great moment. He, he led the club to a great, uh, uh, great um, oh, what's the word? Uh, just a respect level from the boys because they knew if Red Bastine was involved, it was something very, very good to be involved with, uh, to show up and be a part of at the banquet or be honored by uh, Red and his, and his group of board of directors at the time. And it was just a respected organization, even that much more with Red. Now we've got Nick Bockwinkle, which <laughs> Nick speaks for himself. He's one of the greats. And, uh, you know, so it's just, Red is just, uh, he's the man. And uh, uh, to the day I die, uh, I, I don't expect to ever hear anybody say anything negative about Red Bastine. He's just like, to me, like Professor Toro Tanaka was, who was one of my very dear friends that I wrote about in this book, this last book I did. No one ever says anything bad about Professor Tanaka because there's nothing you can say bad. You can knock a lot of people in the business for bad things they might have done to people or whatever incidents they had or drug problems or this or that, but no one says anything bad about a Red Bastine or about a guy like Professor Tanaka who was a gentle soul. And uh, Red was just a wise man, and Red taught me a lot. And uh, he was, he was like you say, he was like a father to me. Uh, Red Red used to always say he was more like an older brother, but <laughs> that's just the way Red was. He could he still makes me laugh when I think about him. Uh, every phone call I ever had with a man w- w- led to laughter, and many times led to tears because we'd laugh so long and so hard about something, remembering things. We used to go to Dodger baseball games. Red loved the Dodgers. We used to we used to go watch the Dodgers play many many times in L.A. And uh, I just have very fond memories of the man. He's a legend, and uh, the Texas shootout that's this weekend, I had, I had originally planned on coming and had to back out uh, uh, this Saturday. I was going to try to make it down to Dallas for that, and I could not do it uh, after all. But um, it's a great uh, that's a great uh, thing that uh, uh, Johnny Mantell has put together and, and running now uh, in honor of Red, the Texas uh, Texas Red. Uh, Red Bastine suit out, and I think it's a great way to honor Red every year there in Dallas. And one of the main reasons I wanted to come out to Dallas was to go to Red's grave. And I just want to sit there and uh, and, and uh, do shed some tears with Red over this grave. And I wanted to do that more than anything this weekend, and, I, and I'm going to have to put it off for a month or two. And Hi, Bill. Come out there uh, another time. Bill, to jump in here, um, uh, like I said, we just met a few days ago, but I wanted to tell you, about what we're doing, we also uh, James Beard and I uh, uh, run the uh, Texas Wrestling Hall of Fame. It's it's very similar to uh, the shootout, uh, but it's it's not the same because we don't want to you know we don't want to try to run something that's that would be disrespectful to what Red started. What we do mm-hmm. is, is we kind of have we 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 have a a gathering kind of like the shootout, uh, but instead of just a gathering. Uh, we do awards. It's a Hall of Fame ceremony, but it's just for the wrestlers and their families. Mm-hmm. Our event is March 15th here in Fort Worth. Uh, so if you would like, I can after the show's over with, I can give you that information. We're honoring Stan Hansen uh, this year. We're honoring Terry Gordy, gorgeous Gary wow. Young. A lot of people are going to be there. Uh, so and we do it every year here. We don't do it for profit. It's not anything we make money off of. Mm-hmm. Uh, next year, the Von Erics are going in. That's something I've been doing the last few years because, like I said, I've broken by Johnny Valentine, and I want to do it to honor the great lineage of this state, uh, people sure. like Red and, and you know, so forth. So if you want, after the show's over with, I'll get you all that information. And if you do, if you were planning on coming down next month, you could come see everybody, you know, at the Hall of Fame if you would like. So you can well, be my guest awesome. if you would like. That, that is very awesome. I appreciate that. That is very awesome. Not a I, you know, I... I have great respect for reunions and get-togethers like that, and uh, it's it's a great thing where the guys can get together and talk about their careers and, and have some fun and a little nostalgia for them, and, and uh, it's really good, you know. it's um, We have to do things like that while we're still able, you know. Uh, red, redhead Alzheimer's. Uh, we just lost the great uh, Louis Martinez uh, recently. It was big around the Detroit area in particular, uh, Arriba Luis Martinez and uh, Martinez uh, he had Alzheimer's also and and you know we have to do these things while we still remember who we are you know and it's just right. um, 
you know, we spend a lot of years in the ring entertaining people and making friends. And uh, uh, I think that's probably, if I had a gimmick, that would be the only gimmick I ever had was making a hell of a lot of friends and uh, and uh, trying to keep my name as good as I could keep it and and make a lot of friends in the business. And, uh, you know, that's why uh, that's why I cherish going to, like, the, uh, you know, CAC and, and reunions in particular because you get to see so many of your old buddies and guys you traveled up and down the road with and or guys you just respected. You never even wrestled on, uh, against them. You just respected them. And, uh, uh, you know, and it's just it's so great. Um, it, I'll see what I can do about uh, coming out there for March, and uh, it's very possible. Uh, now, ben, you, know, uh, you have an in, you have an inbox with all the information waiting for you on Facebook. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate yes, that. And uh, you know, if anybody, uh, if you don't mind, if I just give a shout out to my website, <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody wants to purchase my my two books, I have um, the first book is on my students that I train, and there's some rare pictures of Sting and the Warrior in there. Louis Spicoli was another guy that wrestled around Dallas there for a while and wrestled all over. Yeah. He was with WCW when he passed away. Uh, he was one of my students that I trained in 1988, one of my best friends, dearest, greatest guys I've ever known in my life. Uh, made it such an influence, uh, an impacting influence on my life. He's in the book and a lot of my other students. Frankie Kazarian was a guy that came through my school after being trained originally with Killer Kowalski, but he came through my school to finish up his training. And and a lot of guys, Christopher Daniels, Chris Jericho, and the Godfather actually came through my school and did some workouts and did things. So did Rowdy Roddy Piper years later and uh, years ago. I mean, back in the, in the 80s. And you know, so I I have a lot of uh, rare pictures that are in the book, and that's in my first book. And then my second book is it my tribute book. And you can go on my website, which is uh, www.dickbillanderson.com. It's real simple. And uh, people can click on, there's a link for both the books, and click on the link for, uh, um, and um, uh, also Superstar Billy Graham wrote the foreword for my last book, and uh, my tribute book, and he'll sign every copy of the book too. And that's what I'm going to have him do actually at lunch tomorrow. He's got some pictures and some uh, books to sign for me. And he gladly does this as a favor to me, and uh, we've been old friends and uh, for many years. I just wrote the foreword for his book. Uh, that's com- going to be coming out later this year, his final book of his life called Self-Portrait. And uh, I was honored when Billy asked me to write the foreword for his book. You know, like I always tell people, it's one thing for Bill Anderson uh, to get the foreword done uh, for his book by a superstar, like a superstar Billy Graham, but it's a whole other thing for a superstar Billy Graham to ask Bill Anderson to do the foreword. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm very well aware of the difference of names and drawing abilities and everything else, so I am completely honored, and uh, I'm not going to lie, I shed tears when Billy asked me, because I don't think it gets much bigger and better than that kind of stuff, to be recognized by your peers, and, uh, you know, it goes back to uh, after the late Eddie Guerrero passed away to find out that he put me in his book, he, he mentions me in his book, and, and, and guys like Jimmy Valiant being in his book, Things like that. These are these were my heroes, you know. I mean, I, of course, I knew Eddie years for many years, but Jimmy right. Valiant. I mean, I was the biggest fan in the world of this guy, and then met him one time, had lunch with him. Uh, Ten, fifteen years later, we run into each other at CAC. I'll tell you the story real quick. Run into each other, and as I'm walking toward him, maybe twenty feet away from him, he goes, "Big Bill Anderson," and I looked <laughs> at him like, "What? You remember me?" I said, "Jimmy." Are you serious? And he goes, brother, Big Bill Anderson, come over here and give me a hug and a kiss. So I go over and we hug and we kiss each other's cheeks. I said, Jimmy, I, I was walking down here because I want to buy one of your books. He says, you better buy it. And you're in it. And I go, what do you mean I'm in it? I'm in a book by Jimmy Valiant. And he turns right to the page, and there's a big paragraph talking about how one of his best friends was Big Bill Miller. And he talks about how when he met Big Bill Anderson, I reminded him of his old buddy Big Bill Miller. We're having lunch, and he's talking about us. And I just could, I was in shock. Jimmy Valiant has got the greatest memory of any man in the business ever. And I was so impressed, so happy. And uh, Jimmy bought my book the last time I saw him. He walked over, threw $20 down on the table. He said, brother, I want to buy one of your books. I said, Jimmy, are you sure? And he goes, brother, you bought my book. I'm buying your book. And, you know, (laughs) that's respect, man. That's an honor. And I love it, you know. And a guy like Jimmy Valiant is just the greatest. Love him. 
And uh, that's what CAC is all about, that kind of thing, that, that kind of memories you make. And you're meeting people, your legends, your friends, and uh, you're renewing friendships. It's fantastic. Uh, but uh, getting back to my books, if anybody wants to buy them, they can go on my website and they can go through PayPal. Or if fans are listening and they, they, they can look me up on Facebook also and contact me. Uh, I'm, I'm just under Bill Anderson there, and uh, uh, I'll an- try to answer everybody's messages and or uh, requests for friendships and that sort of thing. I, I try to do the best I can with it. Hey, and one thing, uh, Michael, I've been wanting to tell you this. I haven't officially told you. You know, did you know you were the very actual, very first person that bought my second book? I was. Yes. You were wow. the first person when, when I put it out there on uh, on uh, uh, Amazon. Yeah, I bought it through Amazon, so I had to get yeah. it signed. <laughs> yes, that's why you didn't get it signed, because it went through Amazon, unfortunately. And I, it was before I had my webmaster get it up on my website, because I and, I and I didn't want people to really buy them, but I wanted to get it out there. But I didn't want people to buy it on Amazon, because I had no control over it. Uh, like signing it or anything, because they send it right from their company, which I lose the control over, like having Superstar sign it or me sign it. And that's the only thing I regretted, but I've been meaning to tell you that you're the first person to buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of a cool thing to me. That's awesome. And, uh, uh, yeah. Folks, uh, if you want to go, no. folks, if you want to go to the IHWE Facebook page, if you're a fan, it's, IHWE, it's facebook.com backslash IHWE Pro Wrestling. Uh, after the show, we will have a link directly to Bill's website. On the, uh, for his website, you can go look at his books. You can go purchase his books. Just go to our Facebook page if you would like, uh, if you need to uh, get a link from it, or if you're listening to the show, and sometimes it's hard to hear, uh, go to the facebook.com backslash IHWE Pro Wrestling, and we will put Bill's link up for his website directly after the show and get a couple books. And, Bill, if you come down for the Hall of Fame, bring both your books. I'll buy them both. Okay, that's that's a, that's a fair deal. I, I I'll, I'll be happy to do that, and uh, and I'll let you know shortly if I if I'm able to do that. You know, I'm uh, at this stage of my life, I'm working a regular job in, in my in my senior years here, and uh, so it's it, it's it's I got to see if I can take the time off, but I would love to. Uh, I'd love to come to Texas. Uh, I have a lot of friends in Texas, and uh, it's a it's a cool place. Great great history place for wrestling. One of the greatest states ever. Yes, so, sir. Uh, you know, it's, I, I have, uh, I'm well aware of the history of Texas wrestling. And um, so I'll, I will let you know about that. But I, and I really appreciate you, you guys having me on the show. It's a real honor. And, uh, uh, Anytime. you know, it's, it's, it's been fantastic and everything. And You have uh, an open invitation, Bill. Anytime, just get in touch with me or Mike. Anytime you want to come on, you have an open invitation. Open door anytime, as much as you want. Well, you guys are awesome, and I appreciate what I, you know. What I really appreciate with you guys is your respect that you have for the business, and um, you know, and it, it's really cool. And, and not that, not that, not because I trained the Ultimate Warrior, that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm going to say now. But I really appreciate your your intelligent insight as to why Vince should allow him in the Hall of Fame, and not like I've heard through Facebook, through a lot of fans that have a lot of negative things about Warrior. Uh, you know, trying to compare him to, uh, let's just throw out the Daniel Bryan thing again, trying to compare him to this or that, and it's completely like comparing bananas and oranges. You know, you can't even do it. It's it's a whole different ball game. You know, it's like trying to compare Haystack Calhoun to Andre the Giant's working ability right. in the ring. You know, they're right. totally different animals. You know, it's a different thing. But you know, you have a smart approach to realism of what the Hall of Fame is. It's recognition of somebody's, uh, what they've accomplished in the business. And there's no doubt, Jim Helwig, the Ultimate Warrior, was a success in the WWF. No doubt about it. His main events were were, were numerous. And his draws, and, and, you know, and a little tidbit of uh, nostalgia, I, I'm one of the guys that carried Randy Savage uh, to the ring on his throne with uh, uh, at that WrestleMania 7 in Los Angeles. Oh, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> That's yeah, great. if you look back on the footage, I, I tried to get on the side where the camera wasn't on. So I'm not a, I'm not a I'm not a camera mark. I didn't want I didn't want people to look. Louis Spicoli is another one of the kids that were, that it, did it. They're all my students. Oh, wow. I had all guys from my school do that. And uh, Vince awesome. had us come down and paid that. us 
yeah, paid us hundreds of dollars to come down here and carry Randy with it. Uh, I guess it was um, Sherry Martell uh, yeah. was on the throne yeah. with him. Yeah. And believe me, that thing was heavy as hell. Uh, and we carried Randy uh, and uh, glad her you to didn't the carry ring. When Mabel was king of the ring. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> or, hey, or Big Dusty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. yeah. So. Yeah, so that's a little nostalgic note. Uh, me and Luis Piccoli were two of the guys carrying uh, Randy on that. And uh, I helped set up the cage at WrestleMania, too, at the Sports Arena with Hogan and uh, Bundy, too. Oh, that's and, awesome. And, I, and I'm on video on that, too, if you look back on it. Me and Wild Man Jack Armstrong. And uh, it's just, you know, hey, the things we do for a payoff, you know. It's all yeah, part of the exactly. business. When you love, you love the business. When I was in it full time, I had a passion for it, and I loved it. I'm not in it anymore except as a kind of a writer and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't love it as much as I did. I'm being honest. I'm not in it to make a living at it anymore. That's why. But when I did it, I loved every minute of it. I loved every mile I drove, every autograph I signed, every sweat drop that came from my head or blood drop that came from my head. I loved it. It's what I did. And I have a great respect for the business. I still do. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I pay the price every day for having done it because I'm pretty beat up and uh, had back surgery uh, 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, so I, you know, I I paid my dues for the business. And uh, But, I, you know, I love it. I get, hey, I get to meet great guys like you guys, you know, and, and that kind of stuff is really cool, too. That I'm still able well, we to do really, that. And, we uh, really appreciate you, Bill. I, I like uh, an open invitation I, anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Hey, hey, again, again, here we are. We are running short on time, unfortunately. Bill, thank you for joining us. Uh, one other little thank quick you. tidbit of information I can kind of throw in. Bill, I don't mean to you know date you a little bit, but I do remember you telling us years ago they had a show on ABC television, Tag Team. Roddy Piper, Jesse Ventura played the police <laughs> yeah. officers. That went off. Billy yeah. Anderson played the part of the ring announcer. On the episode of that yes. show, if I'm correct, you were telling us that story. Yes, that is true. That's they did, and, and they, they they took my voice out because they didn't like the acoustics in the building. The, the show people didn't, and they put Gene Okerlund's voice in. And uh, but yes, they used my good-looking face because they didn't want Gene's bald head up in there. Of course, <laughs> you're way better looking than me, and Gene. All right, Bill, thank you so much. We're out of time, Bob. Thank, you, thank guys. you. Love it. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night, Bill. Thank you, Bill. All right. Well, that was a fantastic interview, ladies and gentlemen. BigBillAnderson.com. He's got two books, and his knowledge and history of this business is second to none. Get on there real quick. Uh, Twitter, HXC Fuller. Facebook.com backslash IHWE Pro Wrestling. Check it out. We're going to have a link for Big Bill's website on there. Michael, take it away. All right, yes, the silent host tonight. I try to get in, but people step over me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at EncyclowCCW. You can find my Facebook page at Facebook.com slash Encyclopedia World Class. And also, real quick, before we close out tonight, got a message from Michael Elliott. He was our guest on last week. There are nine days left in the Kickstarter campaign for the Rock and Roll Never Dies documentary. Nine days, people. He still needs to raise some of that money. Go to Kickstarter. Look up Rock and Roll Never Dies, the documentary of the Rock and Roll Express. Donate some money. Let's get this movie going. Let's do this. All right, once again, right, next I am week, Michael Curtis. Next, my next week, David next Fuller, week, and next week, next week, next week, Rob Schreiber. I was getting to that. I was getting to that. Next week, next Go ahead. week. Artist Rob Schemberger will be joining us on February 19th. We will have, as we've been saying all this show, Kevin Von Erich. Next month we have guests such as Jameson, Gorgeous Gary Young. We have Mick Karch coming up. We've got the Miss, we are working on getting the original Mr. Wonderful Rock Riddle to join us. we got some great episodes Every coming era. up. People Every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on IHWE Radio. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week.